Well, good afternoon, folks. Good afternoon, folks. My name is Charles Brown. I'm the director of the Ohio for Lending Coalition, and we've been around for about 34 years working on equal access to credit and housing equity issues across Greater Cleveland and now the state of Ohio. Uh, I want to thank our conference planning committee who helped put this together, and specifically uh, Dr. Keating, whose idea was to do land trusts and put, put the panel together and organized it. And uh, we appreciate very much his work on this, uh, this program. I also want to extend my thanks to all of our sponsors who helped make this possible and you, the audience who participates in this. And as most of you now know, everyone's a Zoom expert. You put your questions in the chat and we'll get them up and running and uh, get them to our panel. Uh, so much thanks. And if anybody who's out there on Zoom land is interested in either A, being a sponsor or joining the conference planning committee, let us know. Upcoming topics are ARPA, which we're gonna do in June. Uh, they're finally figuring out where all the ARPA dollars are going from the county, the city, the state of Ohio. We're gonna take a look at how they're being spent and, uh, and the importance of that. Also coming up in the fall, we're gonna take uh, the debate between the two administrator candidates for Cuyahoga County, which we did eight years ago. So I guess it's time to do it again. And uh, we'll take a look at that. And other topics we'll be looking at are maybe the revitalization of the Cleveland Tenants Organization. So those are the topics we're gonna to be looking at. So I'll turn it over to Dr. Keating and he can talk to the panel. Thanks so much. Look forward to hearing from the panel. Thank you, Chip. I'm uh, Dennis Keating. and. Um... I want to thank uh, those in our audience for uh, joining us. As Chip said, uh, we'll do questions after the presentations, but in the meantime, you can uh, put questions and comments in the chat and we'll get to those. I'm going to uh, introduce the speakers by their titles. They each have detailed biographies on the website. So rather than going through all that in the interest of time, uh, you can look at those if you choose. Meanwhile, I've asked each of them to speak for roughly 15 to 18 minutes, and that'll leave us, I think, a fair amount of time for discussion after their presentations. And uh, the reason for doing this topic in large part is because of the affordable housing crisis, which has received increasing attention around the country. Uh, it varies in its level of magnitude, but um, for Cleveland, Columbus, uh, cities we'll look at today and others in Ohio, uh, we have large numbers of people that either cannot find affordable housing or the housing they're living in uh, requires they're paying a lot more than they can afford, even though they're under a roof at least. So uh, one of the ideas that has uh, emerged from around the country over the last several decades has been the idea of community land trust to reduce the cost of that housing. And we're gonna start with uh, Marge Isak, the president of Equitable uh, Development Solutions, who has a long history with community land trust. And she will lead us into an explanation of what they are and what they uh, accomplish or hope to accomplish. Uh, she'll be followed by Hope Paxton, who's the vice president of programs and housing for the Central Ohio, uh, both Land Bank and also Community Land Trust, which is a, a partnership of the city of Columbus and Franklin County and their leaders, which she will explain as well as various uh, partners they work with. Next will be Ben Trimble from Ohio City Inc. Uh, two CDCs, his and Tremont West Development on the near west side of Cleveland uh, within the recent past have formed a new community land trust uh, in neighborhoods that experienced a growth, particularly in the price of housing. And uh, as he'll explain, uh, this community land trust will hope to uh, retain affordable housing in those two neighborhoods. And finally, from Houston, Texas, uh, Professor Jeffrey Loeb from Texas Southern University. Jeffrey is a national expert and longtime uh, <clears throat> a follower of community land trust. And I've asked him to give us a national overview of community land trust and the movement, and perhaps uh, citing a couple of examples, his own Houston, which is part of a national study, uh, Albany, New York, which he knows well, and some others uh, that are a partnership, as in Columbus, between land banks and community land trust. 
without further ado, Marge, take us in. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, and thanks for having me. Um, so um, I've been working in what's kind of come to be known now as the sort of shared equity housing space um, and with community land trust for over 20 years now, which I have to count that up now. Um, I helped start the first community land trust in Cleveland uh, through some grassroots organizing in the Ohio City neighborhood, which is my neighborhood, uh, as prices were rising in the late 1990s. Uh, I was on the board of the Community Development Organization, uh, which was the predecessor of Ohio City, Inc. And at that time, home sale prices were actually rising in the late 90s at like a 12 to 14 percent rate every year. And we were looking for a solution to keep some for sale properties in the neighborhood affordable even as the market was rising around us. There were community land trusts at that time scattered around the country, mostly on the East and West Coast, not a lot of Midwest ones, which we kept getting a lot of grief around. Um, and HUD, um, the um, Department of Housing and Urban Development was actually funding technical assistance um, in starting up new ones. And so we received that at the Community Development Corporation level um, here in Cleveland. So I'm not gonna give you the full history of that now, um, but the organization went through several iterations um, and the houses that we first developed in Ohio City through the land trust then are now part of the newly formed um, Near West Community Land Trust and Ben Trimble's here and you'll hear from him today on this call and he's gonna talk about that uh, later. So in more recent years, I've been doing technical assistance, um, helping a community land trust in Oberlin start up their very grassroots, um, no staff, um, finishing their first house this summer, um, community land trust there, and then working with Hope and her team in Columbus and Franklin County to start uh, the community land trust there, much, much bigger operation, and you'll hear from Hope about what they're doing. And then I have a role with NeighborWorks America, which is a national intermediary, over 220 NeighborWorks affiliates around the country. And they have a whole new shared equity um, housing initiative. Uh, really, it's an important thing because there are NeighborWorks organizations in many different cities where there are no community land trusts and they some of them overlap and some don't. Um, and so they're trying to expand shared equity housing throughout their affiliates around the country. Um, so what I'm gonna do is give you an overview of shared equity housing in its broader context, and then um, uh, community land trusts more specifically and how they work, and then turn it over to, um, to Hope. So give me a second here to uh, share my screen. Um, and um, hopefully this is going to, um, work and you are now seeing um, my screen, I hope. Um, and, um, and I actually, um, I'm gonna do this without notes, I think it's too <laughs> challenging for me. Um, so what is shared equity home ownership? Um, basically what we're talking about when we talk about that is sort of this middle ground between rental housing and, um, and the market rate um, for sale housing where every, you get everything. Um, but it's where the some entity, a um, foundation or the public makes a one-time investment in a home that makes that house affordable, whatever affordable means. And there's a whole discussion around what that means in a community, makes it affordable for purchase by a working family with modest means. And then the key factor in that is that that home will remain affordable for a family um, after that family purchases it, and then the next family purchases it, and then the next family purchases it. So in return for being able to buy that home at a below market rate, that um, family agrees to limit their proceeds when they go to sell it so that it will stay affordable. And at the, um, at the same time, they're building well. They're building well through the um, mortgage that they get and paying off that mortgage. They're building um, equity, some equity through and wealth through getting a share in the proceeds when they go to sell it. But, at, at this, um, but, but also that house is staying affordable to a family in a similar situation the next time. That public investment 
stays in the home and is affordable to a next um, to the next buyer. Um, and I'll and I'll show you how that um, how that works. So there are a lot of benefits to that. Um, it provides a lot of stability for homes in a neighborhood. Um, there are we'll go into sort of all the kinds of things that. Uh, that that can provide in terms of um, sustaining not just home ownership, but maintaining homes in a neighborhood, uh, sharing home ownership in a neighborhood, assuring that you don't have investor owned properties in a neighborhood. It's land ownership um, in, in a community that's local, um, ensures that public investment stays in the community where you've put it, and it doesn't leave the community and it doesn't uh, go with the first buyer and who wins kind of a lottery. Um, and at the same time, it's a great deal for that first buyer who wouldn't otherwise be able to own a home and who builds, has security of tenure, um, is able to stay in a neighborhood and community and school system and so on, and builds equity in, in being able to do what they want to do for their family's uh, needs. So the primary models of shared equity housing, and these can, different people will call different models, you know, what gets included and what doesn't. But community land trusts are clearly one of the models that people will include under this big umbrella of shared equity housing. Limited equity cooperatives um, will be included under this model. Deed restricted housing, um, and I'm not gonna talk much at all about that, and I'll tell you in a second why. And then resident owned communities, and I'll talk about that briefly. Um, deed restricted housing in some places in California, um, there are a lot of, um, because of state regulations that require an inclusion of affordable homes in many different ways that, um, that are being uh, uh, in inclusionary housing laws. They, um, deed restrictions are used to assure the affordability of for sale housing. Uh, I'm not a lawyer, I'm not gonna to pretend to be a lawyer, but um, my understanding in Ohio is that deed restrictions are a terrible way to do um, restrict the price and the income, which are the two main things we wanna do in assuring aff ongoing affordability um, in housing and that there are a lot of things we could get into, but we don't use deed restrictions to do that. We use a community land trust land lease model and we'll get into how that works. Um, so there's always a balancing act that you're doing when you're doing shared equity housing. We're always balancing the needs and rights of individuals with the needs and rights of community. We want people to benefit from this housing. We want them to build wealth. We want them to have um, uh, security of tenure. We want them to be able to meet their family's needs. At the same time, we recognize that there's a community interest that comes from putting public subsidy into something, that, um, that comes from having a whole nonprofit built around this whole thing, uh, that has to do with, um, with ownership of land and the value of that in a community and what happens to housing in a community and what happens in a neighborhood, uh, you know, what happens in any particular house. We all know that, you know, what happens to the house next door matters to us. Um, and what happens down the road, what happens in the future matters now. Um, what we do now matters in the future and balancing that. Wealth creation with affordability. We want people to benefit from, the, um, from, from those homes. And at the same time, we want them to be affordable for the future. And then there's a risks and rewards. The community can't take on all the risks, but you can't put those all on individuals. Um, and you want some of the rewards to be there. And at the same time, you don't wanna create a lottery system where all the benefits go to the first buyer and then there's nothing left for the second and third and fourth and fifth and many buyers in the future because we are pretty sure we are not going to solve all of our income inequality and income issues um, in the next three years or five years. Um, so, Basically, the kind of I'm going to run through some of these models, um, limited equity co-ops, and I'll end with land trusts and go into those in more details. Um, limited equity co-ops. In that structure, there's a cooperative that owns the building and the land underneath that building. Use often their multifamily buildings, not always. You construct the actual housing structure can be very different. 
Um, but tenant shareholders own a share in the corporation and they receive a long-term proprietary lease to their unit. The whole um, co-op is democratically governed by tenant shareholders. And then what is often very useful is that the land under a co-op could be owned by a community land trust. And, uh, and in fact, there's, it's increasingly understood that that's a really valuable thing because um, if you think about uh, co-op in a rising uh, cost neighborhood, um, and New York has experienced this um, uh, in many cases, the co-op shareholders own and control um, what happens. And if they um, are in a rising neighborhood, a rising cost area, they could buy themselves out. They could essentially sell that whole property and, and assure themselves a windfall. So in many places where co-ops are currently being developed, places like Burlington, Vermont, um, the land trust owns the land under it. They deed that or um, lease that to the co-op and assure ongoing affordability while the co-op does their thing of managing the building, um, democratically controlling the ongoing running of the co-op and so on. But there's this, um, there's this sort of silent partner, they'll call it, um, that assures the ongoing affordability. Um, and there's a national intermediary um, you have in, uh, in New York that's actually gonna be doing some, um, they do some technical assistance, but they're developing a much more robust technical assistance program about doing exactly um, this. Resident owned communities, the sort of what you think of as manufactured housing or trailer parks or um, uh, mobile home parks where the land currently in many cases and these might be more relevant in Northeast Ohio, um, owned by private entities. They lease the land for a monthly fee to um, people who own their, um, their, their homes. And those are not usually real estate. Um, and then, uh, but the transition can be to owners, the residents owning the land cooperatively, another nonprofit owning the land and leasing it for a mission-based purpose of making sure that those um, manufactured home um, owners uh, have security of tenure or community land trust owning the land. The households own their own housing and then they lease the plot on which it sits. And then there might be some other amenities, um, you know, um, it, uh, laundry facilities or a common, you know, community space um, and so on. And then people would pay a monthly fee for other amenities. And if you looked at um, some of the national housing stuff coming out of the Biden administration, they are looking at this um, idea and how they can make um, manufactured housing, mobile home parks more um, accessible to people in terms of the financing and so on. Because usually people have to buy their own, they're, they're not, they can't mortgage them, they can't finance them. So they're looking at how to do this through the federal um, Freddie Mac, um, Fannie Mae. Um, and what's happening, there is a whole, again, national intermediary called ROC USA, ROC, Resident Owned Communities, that helps um, groups that own their own, uh, that, that are on private land to do the financing to buy out a private owner to, um, to help keep those, um, uh, those communities um, safe in terms of security of tenure and ongoing affordability. So then land trusts, community land trusts. Community land trusts are nonprofit organizations governed by a board of directors. Um, the classic community land trust um, configuration is a, what we call a tripartite board where community land trust residents, general community land trust um, members and then public representatives compose, um, comprise the board and they own land for community benefits. Now that community benefits, those, those needs could be rural or urban agriculture, commercial spaces, rental property um, and home ownership. And most community land trusts actually own rental property in addition to um, home ownership projects. Um, the other kinds of urban agriculture, commercial spaces, they're definitely, you can find community land trusts that do all of these things. Um, but, um, but I would say the majority of community land trusts are formed to do 
for sale on um, for houses that are they're going to um, lease and sell um, on an ongoing basis. And then most of them in some way or another end up with um, affordable rental housing as well. So how do they do this? The goal of them is looking at generally the fact that what happens in housing is that market values in most stable or rising markets, market values go up like this and people's modest, people with modest incomes, their incomes going up like this. And so the gap, even if you can fill the gap of um, someone's home ownership, you know, being able to buy a house now, what's gonna happen is that gap is gonna grow over time, the gap between market values and incomes. And you're gonna to have to produce more and more and more subsidy as time goes on to be able to fill that gap. So if you do a down payment assistance program, you're gonna to have to not only, um, that down payment assistance is gonna go with the first buyer. And the next time, not only are you gonna to have to provide it to the second buyer to fill that gap, you're gonna to have to provide more the second time and more the third time even and continue to find more and more subsidy. Well, there's less and less subsidy as we know for housing. And the goal of community land trusts, um, and I always flip these slides, I should, is to, um, to make community land trust homes go up in value, there should be a third line in here, at the roughly the same rate as people's incomes. Um, so they go up in price, but they're not going up as high as market values are going up. And the way that we do this is through land leasing. Um, we do, and in Ohio, um, and there are a couple of other states that are like Ohio, North Carolina is one of them. In many states, you'll, you'll hear community land trust people talk about land trust owns the land and um, land trust homeowners own their, their house. And in many, many states, you can actually do a deed to a house that's separate from a deed to the land, and you don't do that in Ohio. We, there is one deed to the house and the land that the land trust has, and then um, land trust homeowners get a 99 year lease to both the land and the house. Um, and that ties together the, um, the relationship between the two of them. People purchase a leasehold interest in their property um, and they get a mortgage on that. It is a property interest, it's not a lease like a rental lease. It is a property interest gets recorded with the county and it gets mortgaged so that they can um, finance it. Um, and that 99 year lease includes all kinds of things and I'll go into some of them, but it includes the responsibility to live in your house if you're a land trust homeowner. It includes um, your responsibility to maintain the property um, and keep it up. And it includes a resale formula. So that if you decide to sell your land trust home, you're agreeing to basically two things. One is you'll sell it to someone else who is income qualified. And the second is that you'll sell it at a price that's affordable to that second buyer. There are three different kinds of resale formulas that are in use around the country with land trust homes. Um, and I'm not gonna get into those. Um, but that the way every community that do, does a community land trust thinks about how they want to do their resale formula and people understand that before they're buying um, their home. But what happens with that then in terms of making that home affordable is that in a typical um, housing affordability situation, and this would be the top line here is the uh, something like a down payment assistance program or other kinds of housing affordability, the money for assistance goes to the family directly, and then they write a check and buy their home. In a land trust situation or a shared equity situation, the money is going to the program. And then the program writes down the cost of the home. So that family is still getting all the benefit of that um, assistance, all of that subsidy, but they're getting it in the form of a lower cost home, simply. Just, we just, so, so if there is a $150,000 cost home and we have $50,000 of, and these numbers aren't realistic anymore, um, $50,000 of subsidy, in the top case, that family might get $50,000 of down payment assistance and they buy a house for $100,000 that they could afford. In the bottom case, the land trust 
gets that $50,000 to subsidize that home and sells it to the family for $100,000. No strings, no nothing, except they're signing a land lease that says we bought a house for $100,000, they're mortgaging it. And then there's a resale formula that talks about how they're gonna then sell that house if they ever decide to sell. Um, and so what happens then as time goes on is that the value of those homes go up and the value of the subsidy that we put into it, which is the green bars in here, um, goes up as well. The way it rises, the value of the subsidy rises with the market and the cost of the home also rises. So people's equity is increasing, um, but it's not increasing as fast as the market is. So prices are staying affordable um, uh, along with um, uh, similar to the way that people's incomes are rising. And the fact is, um, and so these are some of the things that are in the lease. Um, owner occupancy, as I mentioned, you can inherit, you can leave your land trust home to your heirs. Um, requirement for home maintenance and improvements. You can mortgage it, you can refinance it, and then there's a resale restriction. And this works. Um, it works, it's worked for 30 plus years. It's a model that has been studied and works. And there's the, national, the, the largest um, study to date on sort of shared equity home ownership was done by the Lincoln Institute of Land Policy. And uh, you're gonna, I think, get these slides and I did a bunch of um, resources in, in the, um, at the ending slides and this, this study is in there. But, um, um, but the fact is it, it does work. So things like foreclosures, Less than one in 10 of la community land trust shared equity homes have ever been foreclosed on ever, ever. Um, and, um, and that was in, even during the height of the foreclosure crisis. So less than, you know, prime loans, subprime loans, any kind of loan. Community land trust loans were like, you know, less than half a percent um, in, in, in terms of uh, foreclosure rates. Um, closing the racial wealth gap and the racial equity gap. Increasingly, um, community land trusts are serving households of color to the point where in the most, that most recent study, 43% of shared equity homes are, um, are homeowners, are persons of color. Um, and, and Hope, I think, will have some numbers on her, on her program. Um, and the resale, um, so 95% of shared equity homes are, um, home own, are affordable to people who would pay less than 30% of their income um, if they're at 80% or lower of um, area median income. This is a model that has been proven to work and it's a model that ought to be replicated. Um, and it's, let me go back to that owner occupancy. The, what that owner occupancy means is that people are living in homes and homes and land are secure in neighborhoods and they're not owned by outside investors. They can't be. Um, and that I think is one of the things that, you know, we have this sort of, um, what's old is new again, you know, like um, the, if you look at the history in Cleveland, the, um, when I first started doing land trusts in Cleveland, I was hearing stories of the first land trust that never happened from Frank Ford in the 1970s, early 80s, I think. Um, people talking about co-ops that they wanted to happen and they couldn't access land and capital. Um, those are two critical things. And if you look at you know, the, that story then in the foreclosure crisis, the way that, that, um, that rentals drain money from poor neighborhoods. Um, and I'm not, this is not a, this is not a dissing rentals. I mean, there's lots and lots of need for affordable rental, but private rentals often drain resources from poor communities. And, um, and the, um, the securing land and land ownership in a community is what community land trusts are about. And whether it's for affordable rental, whether it's for affordable home ownership, um, being able to put subsidy into a neighborhood and know that it's staying there um, is really what community land trusts um, uh, are about. And one more quick comment or a couple quick comments. This is really a good moment for community land trusts. Um, 
nationally. Uh, nationally, there is a renewed focus at the federal level. Um, and, and I think Jeffrey will probably talk about some of that, but um, you know, on housing issues and housing funding and the groups nationally that are working on legislation, on um, housing legislation are, have come together. So there isn't this divide and competition between rental and ownership, between public housing and nonprofit housing. Um, the you know, fair lending and um, all of the national housing groups are really in alignment, pretty well in alignment on a national agenda for housing um, dollars. And community land trusts are included in all of them, whether it's as a set aside or as an eligibility issue. So if you're thinking about this in your community, if you are a community land trust, this is the time to make sure your congressional representatives and senators know about you. They're seeing your projects, they're hearing from you, um, because the, um, the, the, the Biden administration and the, um, uh, the potential for funding at the national level is, um, is really, it's potential, some of it, and some of it's real. And so I really encourage people to, um, uh, um, to be pushing for this now in our communities, um, because I think it's a generational opportunity. So I'll leave it at that and turn it over to um, direct, either back to Dr. Keating or on, on to Hope. Thank you, Marge. Uh, we're next gonna hear from Hope Paxton about uh, an example here in Ohio, and that is the uh, Central Ohio Community Land Trust, a partnership of the city of Columbus in Franklin County and other external partners. Hope. Thank you very much. I'm gonna try and share my screen here. Um, why I'm doing that, I just, um, I'm always so glad to be on panels with Marge because she just explains everything so well. <laughs> and it's, it takes a lot of pressure um, to follow her, but I'm gonna see if my PowerPoint is on here somewhere. Um, let's see here, excuse me while I try and pull it up. Well, let me try this again. Excuse me, just one second. It's, I have it pulled up and I'm not being able to share it. So let's see. Well, I know I sent it to your staff person. Maybe she can pull it up. Just, we did this just in case. <laughs> Great, thank you so much. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity to share what we're doing in Franklin County and we'll just keep going through the slides here. Um, so COSIC is a um, community land bank first. We were formed by the Franklin County commissioners and we are a land re reutilization corporation that deals with blighted, abandoned, tax foreclosed properties. Our main goal is to get properties back into productive tax base. When I started with COSIC, that was our one mission and it still is our mission. We um, spent um, $35 million in uh, demolition funding over the last seven years to demolish those buildings in um, infill housing. And we were moving along with closing out a lot of those demo grants two years ago. At the same time, Columbus's market continues to really increase in demand. People are in multiple bid offers here as we speak to buy houses and houses are being sold anywhere from five to 15% over asking. People are uh, foregoing their, uh, are providing appraisal gap money along with forego, um, eliminating their right to remedy and also sometimes their inspection. So we're really starting to see a lot of, um, I don't, I don't want to say despair, but a lot of people are wanting to buy a house here in Central Ohio and are trying to find a way to do it. That's the category of people who have money to go into bidding wars for a house. And then we're still dealing with people who are um, working every day and still are being priced out of the market altogether. So two years ago in 2019, now almost three, um, the city of Columbus and Franklin County were both issuing major reports on affordable housing here in uh, Columbus. 
they um, wanted collectively to try and figure out if a community land trust model would work in our area. So really the city of Columbus and Franklin County came to COSIC and said, can you, can you look and see you're a partner with both? Maybe it would be a good fit. So that's what we did. So here's our mission. We remove barriers, we reuse land and we rebuild communities. Um, going on the, um, Reason, so the Community Land Trust launched in 2019 and we're a subsidiary of, the, of our parent company, the Community Improvement Corporation, the Franklin County Land Bank. Why would a land bank also be a land trust? It's pretty simple. Um, the if you go on to the next slide. Um, so thank you so much for doing that. I'm sorry, I can't control my um, slide PowerPoint, but thank you for helping me with it. Um, the why, we already had the standing community relationships and partnerships. We had just spent seven years working with the city of Columbus Land Bank, which is through the municipality to identify all these properties that needed to come down. And so we had over 1800 lots available for infill housing. So it's been really exciting to not to see this come full circle and the fact that we tore houses that needed to come down, but now we're going back into the communities with new construction housing under the community land trust model and, and filling in the neighborhoods again. So it's really been uh, really powerful. And we wanted to see at the request of the city and county, could we pilot a new program here that really talked about permanently affordable housing? Um, with a different approach for long-term affordability for not only the first homeowner, but the second and third homeowner who's going to come after them. So I um, don't need to go through what a community land trust is. Marge did that um, really well. We follow um, a shared equity market rate appraisal method, um, and we have a land lease that um, governs that relationship between us and the homeowner. Um, so what did we do? We just assembled the experts quickly in 2019 and started to get input about a community land trust. We um, appointed advisory committee members. We had consultants like Marge. We had legal counsel. Um, we brought lenders to the table who we knew had um, experience with leasehold interest mortgages. Um, we do not do our uh, counseling in-house. We do work with very capable HUD housing counseling agencies here in Columbus to make sure that our homeowners are ready and also they do our income eligibility requirements for us. We knew we needed a relationship with realtors and title companies and so we set out to do that um, collectively. Um, we wanted to make the community commitment. And so as we've been working on this the last two years, it's nice to kind of put together what our commitment to the community is. And we want to be available um, to serve, uh, to have a presence in the community and, and come out with really strong community outreach plans for every area where we're going to build homes. Right now we're doing new construction only. So when we go back into the neighborhoods where we were to tear down houses, we want to make sure people understand what we're doing, what a community land trust is. So we've really made a commitment to be available. Um, we are committed to bridging the affordability and racial home ownership gaps here in Columbus. We know that um, there's been areas that have been underserved and we work really hard with our marketing and with our um, outreach plans to make sure that everyone at least hears about a community land trust home opportunity. Um, and we're in it for the long term. We have set up a welcome home stewardship program that takes place the minute they go to closing. They have the keys, they're excited, and we're excited to have them part of our um, life from here on out in, in a relationship of them owning the home and us owning the land. So, you know, wh where do you find support to start a community land trust? Um, we, because we were an established nonprofit, had capital um, as a community land bank. We are supported through Franklin County's DTEC dollar program. So that allowed us to be able to hire consultants and work on legal forms and things like that. So that allowed us to launch quickly because we were all already established. But in order to make this work, we have to have construction dollars. We have a a dual approach to development. So we work with our nonprofit and for-profit housing partners, and we also are the developer on some 
projects when it makes sense to do so. It all takes construction financing funding to, to do this, however. So that's a big uh, area where we need support. And we also always are gonna have to have a discussion about development gap financing and affordability gap financing. Um, what it costs to build right now is extremely high. We list under that. We, want, we do not wanna list at the highest price. We wanna list at a more of a model price for us based on the model of homes we're offering. And then we have a price and then we know what our homeowners can afford under that. And that's the affordability gap. Um, housing costs, as Marge mentioned, continue to increase so much more than the uh, living wages that our uh, potential homeowners are experiencing. So this is always going to be a support issue for us. So our early development for the trust was simple plan. Let's build on lots that we already own and let's work with community um, nonprofit housing partners that we already had, people who are already doing infill housing. We didn't want to um, do anything other than learn at first. And so we worked with them. They were the developers and we were able to build homes based on the city and county support. Um, uh, similar models to what they were already building within the footprint of the neighborhoods where we had um, land. So um, these, this is our, our largest model that we will be doing for the Community Land Trust. This is norm typically a three bedroom, two bath um, home. This will be um, probably always our largest model and that's what we started out with. Um, we approved house plans with our partners and then we decided that we would be, bring the entire home buyer process in house to make sure that no matter who we worked with to build the homes that our homeowners would our home, potential home buyers would have the same um, process to go through to to be able to purchase a home. Now we're kind of into our round two of building houses and we're trying to define our models more. We're trying to have all different square footage um, opportunities depending on where we're building. It's really important that our homes are made well, but also fit in the neighborhood footprint so that people don't feel like it's a disadvantage to have a community land trust home come into their neighborhood. Um, but we also realize we don't need a um, 1,500 square foot home all the time to house people. There's a lot of different household um, people that have less people in their household. So we want to have different models of homes. We're developing our trust standards right now. What is the minimum of things that we want to see in our homes um, from interior design also to exterior uh, you know, footprints? Um, I mentioned our dual approach to development always just in mind of trying to have as consistent of construction schedule as possible. Sometimes we can deal directly with a builder and it makes sense to do so. And other times, of course, we wanna continue our relationship with our nonprofit partners. And we're also now starting to go into our, um, for, to have contracts with for-profit developers who want to help with this issue. Our home buyer selection drawing process, I just wanna to touch on this a minute because I thought people might wonder how we even go about with having such demand, how we have, where we've landed with trying to identify homeowners for our homes. Um, we started with a first come first uh, serve approach that did not last long. We just felt like that was just really not where we wanted to be. So our desire through our drawing process is to manage expectations, be transparent and as fair as possible. Uh, we want to do minimum minimum requirements um, before um, to, so people can be placed into our development queue. So as we know where we're going to build next, they can say, hey, keep me in mind when this gets closer. I would be interested in, in living in one of these homes in this project that you're doing. Um, so we kind of keep track of, of, of our relationship with them, but we don't make them go through a whole pre-approval process prior to us really identifying when and where the development projects are going to happen. We feel that if anyone comes to our orientation and they have an interest in being in one of our development queues, because we're doing multiple projects at a time in different areas of the county and city, we just want people to have an opportunity to be a community land trust homeowner and that they feel that at least they've had a chance to participate. We have many people in our drawings, way more than the houses that we actually have per project, but people understand that. 
And so when we do the drawing, then we literally just start with the, you know, the people who receive the lowest um, numbers and we start to then group them to see if they meet all the eligibility criteria needed to purchase a home, a community land trust home. So, um, and we don't have a lot of requirements, but it is, um, you have to be income eligible. And of course you will have to be approved by a lender who can offer you a leasehold interest mortgage. So, you know, I always say proof is in the pudding and I kind of date myself because I know that's a really old saying, but it's really true. It's how I gauge my success a lot as far as, are we really doing what we say we want to do here? So uh, to date, we have closed on 48 homes. That's been about 48 since the end of 2019. So we're really pleased with that. 72% um, of our households are minority owned, head of households. 57% of our homeowners are at 80% AMI or below. We do go up to 120% AMI here in Columbus because we want to be catching workforce development. That criteria usually between 80 and 100%. We've gone up to, we do go up to 120% to make sure because even at 80 to 100, people can't afford a home here right now. Um, and then we track now because we have this system of home buyer selection drawing process in place. We can track how many people are averaging to be in our project queue. So they come to an orientation and they say, hey, we're interested in this future development project that you're going to do next year. When it gets closer, please keep me in mind. We're averaging about 65 people at least in each queue that we have. And um, the most that we've done in any project development at one time has been 20 homes. Mo most of them are like seven to 10 homes per project. So you can just see how many people want to be in these drawings. Um, and, the, you know, we just don't have as many houses obviously coming online as we do people that are interested. I always like to show our homeowners. It, it, I just love their smiles. We were able to close um, houses during COVID uh, when COVID started. Um, they are happy. They're excited. They see this as a total great step to home ownership. Over 95% of our homeowners are first time homeowners. And so it's just really exciting to see their excitement when we finally get to the table and, and write and sign the papers. And that's it. Um, uh, I always like to show our website, cocolt.org. We really try to make that current and have all the information that I shared today, plus a lot more specific detail. Try to be very transparent about our home buyer selection drawing process, our resale formula, how it works is on there, everything that we have a gallery of homes that we keep there as well. So I always like to refer people back to our website. So thank you. Thank you, Hope. And uh, for the audience, keep your uh, questions or comments coming in the chat. We're now going to uh, hear about a new or one of the newer community land trust. And that's on the near west side of Cleveland with two CDCs and uh, Ben Trimble from Ohio City, Inc. Their uh, real estate and residential development uh, director is going to tell us about uh, the Ohio City and Tremont neighborhood uh, venture for Near West Land Trust. Ben? Thank you so much, Dr. Keating. So I'm Ben Trimble. I'm the uh, Chief Real Estate Officer at Ohio City Incorporated, and I'm also the Acting Director of the Near West Community Land Trust. Um, we're a very young land trust. Um, we started about a year and a half ago. Um, unfortunately, with, without some of the, you know, the established funding streams of some other folks that you've heard here, um, but we're kind of taking a bootstrap approach to try to um, safeguard as many affordable assets as we can in both the Ohio City and Tremont neighborhoods, as well as to try to build new housing. So, um, so I don't know, if, for the folks that aren't in Cleveland um, on the call, um, oh, mo most of the city of Cleveland really struggles with disinvestment um, and um, and vacancy, et cetera. Um, however, the near west side of Cleveland, the um, Detroit Shoreway, Ohio City, and Tremont neighborhoods um, have, have really, um, sorry, grown um, drastically over the last, um, you know, 10 to 20 years. Um, we've, we've seen massive increases in home values and rents over the last decade. Um, um, we had started working with Tremont the last few years because we both kind of share a real estate market. Um, we also um, are both um, 
our nonprofits in Cleveland always struggle kind of with, with staffing abilities and, and um, shrinking resources. And so we started kind of sharing expertise and staff um, through both, through both uh, neighborhoods. Um, and just a little context on our, um, on our neighborhoods. Um, from uh, 2010 to 2019, the Tremont neighborhood saw an appreciation rate of over 300% in single family homes. Um, Ohio City saw about a 70% um, increase, but um, about a thousand percent over the last 20 years. Um, our average sale price um, um, in 2000 was, was something like $10,000, um, and it's now up to $260,000. Um, so both both these um, neighborhoods now outpace the median sales prices um, of the city by about five times, and even over the Cuyahoga County suburbs um, by about $90,000 per unit. So um, there's been a, a massive increase in property values um, over the last decade, especially. Um, both organizations, you know, over the last 10 years that have tried to deal with this in, in, in a bunch of different ways. Um, you know, we've, we've negotiated community benefits agreements with developers um, that included um, them developing mixed income housing, um, some of which was, you know, low income housing tax credit, um, housing, um, some of which were affordable units that, you know, were sold to, to lower income buyers, um, some of which um, were transfers of, you know, existing homes that they owned in exchange for land bank lots that they were going to receive, um, stuff like that. And we've also developed affordable rental housing. Um, unfortunately, for, for a lot of the reasons that you, you've heard um, Marge go through, um, we didn't feel like, you um, any of those were, first of all, we're meeting the, the extraordinary need here. And they also um, fell prey to the kind of traps that we were, we were talking about with a one-time transfer of wealth, you know, especially in a, in a really highly appreciating real estate market. You know, if we negotiate the transfer of, of, of a unit or two to a low-income family, um, the, the land values and housing values are so high that those folks are going to sell as, you know, as soon as maybe those deeds, um, those deeds, um, our transfer, for instance, like the five-year affordability um, periods that were included in a lot of these things. Um, and so while, while it provides a temporary um, access to wealth for one family, it doesn't, you know, deal with the kind of long-term affordability that we'd like to see in both neighborhoods. Um, and so that's why, you know, we, we um, ended up leaning towards the land bank lot. Um, we'd begun kind of a collaboration with Tremont um, with some funding from Enterprise um, to share staff expertise um, for development as well as property management accounting. Um, and through the, that whole process, we decided to form an entirely new entity that was focused just on providing um, affordable rental and home ownership um, units. Um, and so we created, well, a couple of different entities, uh, one of which is the Near West Partners, which is kind of a shared entity that will do a lot of different things um, and then we formed a new um, strategic uh, partnership um, through the land trust. So once again, just the, the, the reasons we decided on that, you know, maintaining affordability and perpetuity. Um, and we're really focusing on housing gaps in the market that aren't served, uh, similar to Columbus. Um, we, we have in Ohio City a lot of very low income uh, rental units um, through CMHA. You know, there's, we have about 2,000 units of public housing in Ohio City. Um, and I, I think about 800 in Tremont um, through different, um, through different um, both HOPE 6 projects as well as um, CMHA units. So th there's a large concentration of zero to 30% housing um, and from AMI, and we have a lot of market rate development, but we have a huge gap in what the market will provide and the other folks that are being priced out of the market. Um, natural, naturally occurring affordable housing that's being taken offline and redeveloped. Um, as well as a new, new construction stuff that, that just doesn't meet the, the income requirements of folks that are being priced out right now. Um, so that was our focus, uh, both for rental as well as for, um, as for, um, for sale. Um, we do have a shared equity model, um, which is 35% um, you know, appreciation shared to the homeowner. Um, we, we structured a land lease fee and we have a replacement reserve fee to, to cover long-term um, costs. Um, that might be um, not be able to handle by the homeowner. Um, so we did this, you know, research both with enterprises, an enterprise fellow that we had at the time, as well as, as our attorneys. Um, um, we founded in, in uh, 2020. Um, so our first actions actually was to take title 
um, to the remaining interest of the former Cuyahoga County Community Land Trust that Marge actually started um, about 20 years ago, Marge. Um, and so, um, but unfortunately, you know, Marge, Marge was, I think, truly ahead of her time at that point, you know, and I, I think in Cleveland, there hasn't been as much interest in this land trust model, though there is a lot more, more recently. And part of that is just because the, I think the extreme, you know, the extreme problem with disinvestment and vacancy and flight from the city that, that I think even now, a lot of folks don't see, you know, the affordability problem in Cleveland as being paramount as, as they do to, to say stoking markets still, you know, and, and failing markets, um, which is understandable. Um, you know, we, we took part um, along with the city and many other partners um, in a tax abatement study of the last couple of years um, that kind of tried to gauge um, with the tax abatement policy and the effect it was having on the city, as well as, you know, kind of the, the investment and um, the levels of investment in the city. And what that study found was that there were only like nine block groups in the entire city that were experiencing a lot of displacement pressure. Unfortunately, a lot of them are located in Ohio City and, and Tremont. Um, and so, so when you look at, you know, the hundreds of blocks in the city that a lot of which are, you know, really in need of investment, um, I don't think that the affordability problems that our neighborhoods and a couple of the other ones like um, the University Circle in Detroit Sherway um, are having have have warned the kind of have gotten the kind of response that, you know, um, that the kind of disinvestment that happens in a lot of other neighborhoods has to this point. Um, so um, we are currently planning transfers um, of both our assets um, here in Ohio City, um, as well as um, Tremont's affordable rental portfolio um, that um, is about 50 homes, um, including, you know, a 40 in a building that we own here, as well as a bunch of doubles that Tremont has um, has developed over the years um, through a lot of land transfers, et cetera. Um, so just to, just to kind of perpetually safeguard those, um, I have been um, part certainly of, of um, organizational change here um, at our neighborhood where, um, you know, depending on board composition, folks um, were interested or not interested in, afford in owning affordable housing. Um, and so one of the big reasons that both Tremont and ourselves um, thought that the land trust model and a separate organization was very important was to safeguard these assets long term um, because um, you know we have some even we're a resident elected board and so you know um, depending on our board composition at one time we have folks that that might um, be that wholly support um, affordable housing and then we might have a swing the next time and um, depending on who's elected we might have folks that um, want to divest of our entire portfolio which I've actually seen parts of um, in my time here. Um, and so one of our first actions will hopefully be to transfer um, transfer some of our affordable assets that are existing into the land trust. Um, and we also, um, something we've been working on for some time, we have, had, have an agreement with the city of Cleveland to develop over 40 land bank lots that are scattered throughout both neighborhoods. Um, we've actually designed and permitted those first homes. We even had a ceremonial grand, groundbreaking for the first one, and then got our um, our final um, our final um, construction costs in uh, later that week, and realized we were about forty percent of our budget because of the the massive increases uh, in um, in lumber costs um, caused by the pandemic. And so, we've been sort of. Um, reevaluating our construction methodology of the last year, trying to find efficiencies wherever we can. Um, and now we're actually back in conversations with the city of Cleveland as well as the county um, to hopefully um, try to try to close that affordability gap because right now um, we're about a, a hundred thousand dollars over what we can provide for. And we don't have unfortunately um, we don't have a, a a a bond issue or anything from our city, unfortunately that you know that um that Columbus enjoys. And so we were, were relying basically on a small amount of HTF funding that, that, that the city had provided and the, the, um, the value of the land being free, um, as well as you know some really small efficient units to try to bring down the construction costs. But because of rising construction costs, um, we haven't been able to um, start our new construction products. Um, we do have our first rehab under construction at um, York, probably will be slated for 120% AMI buyers. Um, I'm hoping that if the city, um, you know, with the new administration that we have a renewed commitment to affordable housing, especially in neighborhoods like ours, 
Um, and so I'm hoping if the conversation, you know, um, goes well with them that maybe we can bring some grant funds to help buy down the cost of a house like this. Um, so the lessons we've learned so far, I mean, like I said, we're very young, um, but, um, you know, we'd kind of depended on the low subsidy model um, and it's very sensitive to price increases. Um, we, uh, we also have a, a number of tax issues um, that we are dealing with as our affordable housing is, is aging out of tax abatement in the city of Cleveland. Um, new construction in the city currently um, enjoys a 15 year tax abatement. We have a number of assets, both the ones that we bought from Marge, as well as um, like a 40 unit building of affordable housing that we own, of a low income housing tax credit building that we own that are really, really struggling with, um, you know, uh, with the tax burdens that's put on them in these high appreciating areas. So. We had we actually had to release one of the first um, the first um, land trust homes that we purchased um, from CHN last year because the 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 taxes were such a burden that we couldn't actually find a, a new buyer for a homeowner that wanted to sell um, and so that's something that we're working on you know with a statewide coalition that we've been discussing kind of um, of other land trusts um, as well as at the local level trying to talk to our county auditors about what you know what ability they have, at least within the existing law, to try to relieve some of those pressures on our buyers. I mean, we also that we need a broader commitment, both, you know, the federal level, like Marge said, that there's been a lot of talk, thankfully, about land trust in the last year. Um, you know, it was hopefully um, going to be part of funding that's now been stalled um, by one Democratic senator from West Virginia. Um, and um, we really need, you know, state, state level funding as well as local. Um, because uh, there are huge gaps, there's a huge need, and, and none of that's being filled at this point. Um, and with that, I think I'll turn it back to Dr. Keating. Thank you, Ben. And um, we'll follow you with uh, lessons from a startup like uh, Near West. Uh, we're going to finish with our last speaker, Professor uh, <clears throat> Jeffrey Lowe from Texas Southern University in the uh, city of Houston, Texas. And I've asked uh, Jeffrey to give us an overview. Uh, Marge referred in part to that. Uh, there's a national network of land trusts, uh, including those uh, that are like the uh, Columbus Franklin County example, uh, combinations of land banks working with community land trust for affordable housing. And also as in Ben's example, uh, dealing with things like gentrification in uh, older neighborhoods and dealing with the uh, issue of the disparities between the minority uh, groups and their ability to uh, own homes, as well as uh, low-income renters seeking better housing. So, uh, Jeffrey, why don't you uh, finish it up from Houston, Texas? Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dennis. And I just have really enjoyed hearing what's happening in, in Ohio. Uh, I am really appreciative of being here and listening. And I think all of your speakers have, uh, presenters, you know, have uh, provided, um, I think, what's really happening on the ground. What I'm hoping that I can accomplish as I try to give this more broader level um, view is to perhaps tie in some of the things that you've already heard uh, as well as perhaps offering um, a more critical assessment uh, as we move forward. I've been involved in uh, research on CLTs for a number of years. And uh, more recently, I've engaged in some research with uh, Dennis, as well as um, Natalie Prochesca looking at how local governments uh, are supporting a relatively new innovation um, in, uh, in uh, our sphere. Um, and I believe Hope already talked about it, but I would like to go deeper into how uh, local governments are supporting uh, CLT uh, and land bank uh, collaboration. And I'll give um, some examples outside of your area uh, focused on the Albany uh, CLT in New York, as well as the Houston uh, uh, CLT uh, here in Texas. I think Marge 
beautifully um, explained uh, CLTs as a form of shared equity housing. Uh, but when we look at the history of the CLT model in the US, it emerged out of the 1969 uh, civil rights, excuse me, uh, movement in Southwest Georgia as a means for gaining collective ownership, empowering African-American communities and overcoming housing discrimination and economic uh, oppression. Uh, caused by something that we've heard a lot uh, today, um, particularly in this new era of, of, of social movement um, uh, to eliminate this economic uh, oppression that has been, that stems from uh, white supremacy really in Terra. Now the model has certainly been uh, modified over the years, we've learned some things and we really uh, believe that CLTs have become um, a better tool uh, for creating permanent affordable housing. And so over the next five decades, uh, since the founding of the first uh, CLT, uh, New Communities in Southwest Georgia, they've continued to emerge primarily in major cities uh, and regions across the country. Now, one of the uh, persons who, have, who has worked tirelessly um, in the CLT movement is uh, John Davis. And John Davis has a, has a saying, uh, don't forget the C in the CLT, community land trust. Don't forget the importance of community. So beyond the affordable housing provision, uh, CLTs hold the potential to advance a more equitable society transformation uh, should a greater share of land come under community control. Community control in the context of CLTs means placing current and future low-income residents at the center of decision-making about neighborhood needs. CLTs offer permanent affordable housing and a governance structure providing protection for lower income households. Today, approximately 280 CLTs exist nationally and increasingly local jurisdictions that we've heard here are recognizing the CLT as a very effective means for stewarding public investment in housing. Again, you have your example right there uh, in Columbus. Land banks, on the other hand, are created through state enabling legislation requiring tax delinquent and abandoned properties with the ultimate goal of adaptation and assemblage back into productive use. And Dennis has done a lot of work already looking at uh, land banks. They've increased substantially over the past few 15 years, particularly since the, as a response to the foreclosure crisis. And there are uh, over 170 land banks in 22 states. So given that land banks hold land and property to recirculate back into you, and CLTs need land and property to expand their housing portfolios in order to achieve their objectives. The combined efforts of CLTs and land banks could provide a property pipeline that preserves public subsidy for affordable housing over the long term. However, CLT and land bank collaborations only exist in a limited number of places. Um, right now, we, it, it appears that there are approximately uh, five uh, CLT and land bank collaborations. A CLT land bank collaboration has the potential to strategically coordinate the decommodification of land, removing it from the property market, excuse me, the private market on the front end and placing it under community control 
long term. And we believe this collaboration also enables us to bring permanent affordable housing uh, as well as community control to scale. Coordinating the legal benefits of holding property cost-free in a land bank with the democratic participation in the control of housing, that is CLT's tripartite board provides, could advance neighborhood stabilization in overlapping CLT land bank jurisdictions. And again, creating this uh, property pipeline. Now, our current understanding about CLT land bank collaborations um, is limited, again, primarily because there are just a few. Um, and in our work, um, we've kind of focused in on a few of those. Um, we've looked at Columbus. And what I'd like to uh, share with you today, um, and, and this research will be forthcoming uh, in a peer-reviewed uh, uh, article. What I'd like to focus in on is the role that um, the Albany and the Houston CLT um, has played in their communities in bringing uh, both uh, housing and community control to scale. Albany denotes the case where the grassroots origins of the network provision of affordable housing and its financing has had a long and successful uh, organic history and contains the oldest um, CLT across our cases. Um, Houston reflects the strong market weak uh, planning orientation, if you will, with a relatively small or new public sector um, initiated for um, such collaboration to take place. When we look at Albany, when we look at Albany, uh, the Albany CLT was created in 1987, and it grew out of an organization known as the United Tenants of Albany. Um, now, uh, UTA launched a number of community-based um, initiatives uh, or programs, um, the Albany Housing Partnership, as well as its community uh, loan fund that serves uh, the region. Uh, all uh, four of the organizations uh, that it launched are members of a coalition uh, known as Housing for All. Uh, and this coalition of housing and human services providers, uh, community activists and concerned citizens urged Albany lawmakers and city planners to pursue innovative ways for preserving and expanding the supply of affordable rental housing uh, in the city of, of Albany. They also had a major impact on ensuring that inclusionary zoning um, was updated in the uh, uh, city's um, comprehensive plan uh, known as Rezone Albany back in 2012. Uh, in 2014, the Albany County Land Bank um, was established and it's the second largest land bank in the state of New York. Uh, it has been uh, supported generously, um, relatively speaking, in, in comparison to other uh, land banks we find across the country, uh, by the state of New York, uh, that has allowed it uh, to advance its acquisitions and differentiations of uh, vacant properties. Um, for the first four years, the Albany County Land Bank received $1.75 million from uh, Albany County uh, general funds. And it expects to uh, receive an annual appropriation of $250,000. Uh, um, <clears throat> 
the uh, Albany uh, County uh, Land Bank uh, also has representation from, uh, uh, from those who serve on the Planning Commission. Um, and they also have used their funding, I should mention, to hire a neighborhood stabilization coordinator who, um, uh, and they have that represented representation, excuse me, also on their board. Now, in terms of the work that, uh, that the Albany Community Land Trust is doing, their portfolio consists of 36 homeowner units, as well as 35 rental properties that contain 50 dwellings uh, in total. Um, the Albany Community Land Trust fosters city and county recognition uh, that a quality housing stock of permanently affordable rental housing is necessary for long-term um, residents less concerned about building home equity, but who desire long-term security, typically unavailable through conventional means. Several renters along with homeowners have become active uh, in the CLT's government um, affairs. Now, I think this is important because over the past three decades, as they uh, see themselves being successful in facilitating shelter uh, security uh, and neighborhood stability, as well as community building, uh, the Albany CLT really takes a targeted block level uh, approach to development, you know, rather than uh, scattered uh, site uh, development. Uh, Albany CLT recognizes both approaches could benefit the partnership with the land bank, but efforts in lower income neighborhoods would benefit more taking the targeted approach. In October of 2016, the city of Albany received a grant from the New York State, from New York State, excuse me, again, to hire this neighborhood stabilization coordinator. But they also received a million dollar commitment from the mayor to establish a vacant building rehabilitation program to support the acquisition and renovation of vacant properties. They've also received $900,000 from the Office of the State Attorney General via the National Mortgage Settlement um, that came out of the foreclosure crisis. Uh, this is administered by Enterprise Community Partners and it has helped the Community Land Trust uh, there to expand their network and programmatic uh, activities. Now, Houston, which is the fourth largest city by population and certainly the largest uh, city in Texas in the, as well as the uh, southern region of our country, faces a severe um, housing crisis as many other places. Um, and, you know, I should uh, also uh, mention here that um, in terms of uh, U.S. metropolitan areas, the affordable housing units for extremely low-income households, uh, only 50 affordable housing units are available for every 100 households, earning 50% of the area median uh, income. And that's data that comes from uh, the National Low-Income Housing uh, coalition. Uh, and so while we have not uh, established a housing plan for the city or the county, um, in 2015, under our newly elected mayor at that time, uh, Sylvester Turner, who campaigned on making city, making Houston a more equitable city, appointed uh, Tom McClaston, who was the director, to become the director of housing and the community development uh, department here in Houston. Uh, 
Tom had gained a deeper understanding of of CLTs, and he met with uh, uh, persons in the neighborhood. Uh, one of the historic neighborhoods, uh, the historic third ward, where I had been doing some work after working with establishing or advancing uh, the CLT movement in New York City upon my arrival here. Uh, Tom becomes the uh, director of housing and community uh, development. He finds money or resources that essentially had been lost, approximately $40 million that had, um, that should have been uh, dedicated to affordable housing uh, provision. He finds it and he takes a significant portion of those funds uh, to help establish um, in 2018, the Houston uh, CLT. Um, and those funds amounted to uh, eleven uh, million dollars that came from the tax increment redevelopment zones uh, monies, and that's similar to what most uh, cities have as their TIF uh, districts. The city also invested a hundred, also invest a hundred and five um, thousand dollars into long-term affordability uh, for homeowners who agree not to place their homes um, on the market uh, for five years. So uh, this is a new program that was established and it's pretty much bifurcated. Um, you have those who will, may want to go the CLT route and then you have those who may want to use their resources uh, to become uh, first time uh, homeowners. And eventually, once that uh, ceiling is lifted, they then may go towards the, uh, the market in terms of, of, of their housing. Now, um, soon after the establishment, of the Houston uh, CLT, the Houston Land Bank was uh, initiated. And I should mention, uh, it was really a restructuring of an entity that already exi uh, existed, which was the Land Assemblage and Redevelopment Authority. Uh, that authority had been in existence for uh, at least 19, up until 1999, uh, that's when it was first established. So today, uh, the Houston uh, CLT and the Houston Land Bank uh, established a collaboration upon uh, their establishments in uh, 2017, 2018, uh, respectively, for the construction and selling of 1,000 homes in various neighborhoods um, across the city. And those 1,000 homes were expected to be um, established over a five year uh, period from 2019 to 2024. That was the um, idea. And the um, one, the $11 million that I mentioned above covered uh, construction costs and certainly startup costs. Uh, the Department of Housing and Community Development also earmarked $5 million to the Houston Land Bank for land acquisition and the administration, again, of the new home development uh, program. So uh, Dennis, how am I doing on time? Because I um, probably wrapped wrap up in a couple minutes. Okay. Again, right. So I think seeing uh, the various activities that have happened in both um, Albany and Houston, there are a couple of things that um, in our research that we we find to be um, you know truly important. 
Uh, public support certainly is essential. Um, in both of the examples that I provide, um, clearly the decision makers sought to stymie the housing crisis and, uh, and the effects of, of, of gentrification. So without the support of the mayors, um, Kathy Sheehan uh, in Albany and Sylvester uh, Turner in Houston, joined by public uh, administrators like uh, Tom McCaslin, uh, much of the support you know, would not really have been um, available. But what we also find um, in the two places I contend is that the collaboration was really more successful or has the potential certainly of being successful or benefiting the work of the Community Land Trust because in Albany, the CLT really comes from a long tradition and history of, of, of grassroots mobilization and organizing. Uh, they really have worked to influence policy. Here in Houston, um, the collaboration between the CLT and the land bank has been um, somewhat of a bumpy road. For the most part, it still functions as an, as an initiative. Uh, it has not gotten to the point of really having, being transformative in terms of policy uh, development as these things go. And uh, this week, in fact, on Thursday, um, the CLT will celebrate um, the establishment of its uh, not 1,000, but first 100 homes. I think there is um, this um, notion of, again, as we think about going to scale uh, with, with permanent affordable housing versus community control. It's important to think about how we uh, establish balance. Um, left to their own devices, land banks operate primarily according to market restoration tactics and no community control or affordability protections um, typically uh, are in place when it comes to property disposition. With the CLT model implemented to its fullest extent, when residents of CLTs are engaged in creating policies of CLTs, households can stay in place or in place as places improve and residents are empowered in neighborhood decision-making. Whether or not community control is deprioritized for a focus on permanent affordable housing, depends on CLT credibility within the city or the regional political economic context and the means by which CLT collaboration takes place. So I'm going to um, conclude and maybe we can spend more time um, uh, in discussion. But what our case studies do underscore is how the intensity of community control varies across different types of CLT collaborations. Community control is best realized through the grassroots classical emphasis of the CLT model. This grassroots approach is best illustrated again in the Albany case. In the Houston case, community control is currently secondary to the construction of new homes. Because the premium placed on community control is unique about CLTs, scaling up the CLT model necessarily means scaling up the social control of permanent affordable housing when ownership is the focus. CLTs focused on rental housing are providing a service 
increasing the affordable rental housing stock in a way that is not extractive. This adds enormous value as an alternative to the US housing crisis. Providing housing security would allow for neighborhood stabilization as well as empowerment in the lives of its tenants. Thank you. Thank you, Jeffrey. Um, so in our examples, including Jeffrey's, the numbers of homes or rental apartments is relatively small. However, as Jeffrey just pointed out, they make an important contribution and particularly in that they provide permanent affordable housing. And they also uh, address issues such as Ben talked about in the two Cleveland neighborhoods in terms of uh, providing security of tenure on a long-term basis for uh, families of generally modest uh, means. So with Catherine's help, uh, we're first gonna go through the chat, although I think several of the questions have already been answered. Before we do that, I'd like Marge to just briefly mention her involvement in, I believe, an effort to have a statewide network of community land trust in our state of Ohio. Yeah, so thanks, um, Dr. Keating. So there are currently uh, six, I believe, incorporated community land trusts in Ohio. Um, two in Cleveland, actually. There's a half, one in Huff that has recently incorporated. Um, there is one in Dayton um, that has very recent, more recently incorporated. Uh, one in Yellow Springs, uh, uh, Columbus, uh, the Near West, and did I count up six? Um, and so we are forming a statewide uh, Ohio Community Land Trust Network. And the hope is that there are several issues to work on on a statewide basis. Ben mentioned the challenge, the incredible challenge of taxation. And the goal um, for community land trusts in ta on taxation issues is to say, um, if, if we're in a home ownership situation, community land trust homeowners should pay taxes property taxes, but they are never going to get the full value, market value of their homes. So what we'd like to be able to work on, and many community land trusts have successfully managed this around the country in many different ways, um, is that they should be able to be taxed on the, um, the, the shared equity, the limited equity portion of their property and not on the full market value. And that would do, go a long way to keeping their property um, uh, affordable. Right now they are taxed on either they have abatement for a short term or they're taxed on the full market value and that's a real challenge in a lot of places. And then we're also working on just um, increasing the, uh, we hope by the end of this year really to be uh, organized as a, um, a, an, an entity and then um, probably work on, you know, increasing recognition, recognition and potentially increasing uh, some funding for CLTs at the state level. Thanks though for that possibility of being able to talk about that. Thank you, Marge. Um, so Catherine, if you could take us through uh, at least the chat questions that have already not been answered. And then uh, Zach asked if we have time left, we've got about 20 minutes. Uh, if people have other questions or comments, why don't you just raise your hand and I'll, uh, I'll call your name. So Catherine. Yep. All right. So one of the questions in the chat is, have those active in Cleveland or elsewhere in Ohio or nationwide, seen increasing numbers of bank lenders or other lending partners who are willing to issue mortgages to CLT homeowners. Um, maybe, in this, maybe Hope could uh, answer that in the context of Columbus, since you mentioned you had lenders in your uh, advisory group. Yes, so we work with three lenders right now, and we're always in discussions with any other lender who would like to offer a leasehold interest mortgage. So right now, I put it in the chat who we're working with, which is Huntington, First Commonwealth, First Merchant Bank. And um, these conversations are always ongoing, and we um, you know, continue to want to add to the portfolio, just like all the community land trusts. We're, maybe someday we'll have a nationwide network of, of uh, mortgage companies who uh, can work in different areas of the country. So. Thank you. Heather, next. Yep. Um, how are property taxes affected since the land is owned by the CCLRC or Land Bank? How about you, Mark? Do you want to handle that one? 
Sure. Um, as I just mentioned, um, in Ohio, there by state law. Um, so in some communities, there is property tax abatement, and it's usually for a short time. Um, and uh, by state law, there's no special treatment for community land trust homes. So they are assessed at fair market value and taxed that way. In the land lease, community land trust homeowners pay property taxes. They're, um, you know, if you're a renter, you pay property taxes just through your rent. You just might not think it, but you, you're doing that um, because your landlord's not like, you know, paying that extra. They're paying it, but you're paying enough rent to pay your property taxes. In the land trust situation, it's not as if the land trust has a separate means to pay property taxes. It almost always is a direct, you're paying it through your mortgage. Um, and so uh, again, in some states, um, either by state statute or by uh, the ability of the county assessor, um, they are able to limit the assessed value of a land trust home so that they're limiting the property taxes that are paid but in Ohio, currently land trust homeowners pay the full market, um, pay ta property taxes on the full market, uh, um, assessor um, assessed value of their homes. Okay, Cousin. This next one is uh, just kind of looking for more elaboration. This uh, participant says, I would love to hear more from the panelists regarding their community control practices, decision making, and how involved residents are in governance practices, um, referencing what Jeffrey just shared. So I think Jeffrey pointed out the Albany example of the ones we've um, heard about today. I don't know if you want to make an additional comment, um, Jeffrey. Yeah, so in, in the Albany example, uh, you have residents who are engaged, certainly uh, renters as well as homeowners in the tripartite board structure of the, of the CLT. But over time, I think because of its grassroots orientation, you also, uh, we've also noticed or identified uh, CLT uh, residents being involved in other um, areas of the city. So for example, you have uh, CLT board members serving on um, the comprehensive planning um, uh, board um, and in some of the other uh, entities that have been uh, established um, in the city to support um, affordable housing and certainly land use. In Houston, uh, given its structure and it being um, an innovation of public, uh, the public sphere, the local public sphere, uh, Houston at, uh, at present, or at least, uh, shall I say, um, near the end of 2021, at that time, they had no um, board uh, residents who were board members of, of, of the CLT. Again, the focus was, has been on establishing um, the construction of new homes, and some of those would uh, end up in the portfolio of the Houston CLT. Uh, the planning uh, or the notion uh, that leaders had was once um, they uh, reached a critical mass of, of homeowners, they would then um, provide uh, an opportunity uh, through board expansion or through board rotation for uh, homeowners to become involved um, in the CLT uh, governance structure. I think as uh, Hope would probably attest, uh, in addition to involving the homeowners and tenants, uh, there's usually a mix of elected officials, bankers, uh, community development representatives or community representatives, and as always, a lawyer or two, I think. So it's... Uh, a mixed uh, combination designed to draw on support for the uh, community land trust 
I think we uh, would attest and probably Marge would agree with that, yes. Yep. Okay, Catherine, onward. Certainly. Um, the next question is, what are some suggested reading for attorneys or other interested parties in broadening their knowledge base on how to establish these entities? Um, I believe Marge put something in the chat already. I, yeah, I did. I put a reference to the CLT technical manual, which is, I think, um, I was just looking it up. Um, I think it's about 40 chapters. So um, Zach, you can start reading. That. <laughs> um, and then uh, and the Grounded Solutions Network, I, I, the, my slide presentation, I assume you'll all have access to that, has a lot of different resources um, listed. And um, so, you know, it doesn't, and they have a startup, CLT Startup Hub on their website. So, you know, you can kind of, it kind of has a nice, sort of roadmap, you know, if you, uh, to, to give you an idea. Um, and then they also do a lot of webinars and so on. And, um, and then other kinds of, you know, ways to, yeah. So those would be great places to start, certainly. And then call me if you want. If I could jump in here uh, as well, I guess the beauty of being in a, this taking place today and I'm in my office, you know, there are books that I can pull off the shelf. Um, some of them old, uh, some of them uh, new. So if, if you can see the camera, probably the oldest uh, book, and I think Marge, you may have mentioned it, is the Community Land Trust Handbook. Um, and uh, that was, came, was published back in the 90s, I believe, from the Institute for uh, Community Economics. There's also the Community Land Trust Reader published by uh, John Davis that I mentioned uh, earlier. And more recently, um, looking at uh, the global movement of, of CLTs uh, published by, edited by uh, John Davis and others, you have the book On Common Ground. Um, I think Marge is absolutely correct by in terms of the work uh, that Grounded uh, Solutions, the Grounded Solutions Network is doing and offers. I think more recently as organizations are certainly beginning to uh, collaborate with each other, I think the Center for Community Progress uh, has also offered some uh, publications and and recently, I think, did some work with the uh, Federal Reserve, issued a report through the Federal Reserve Bank of Atlanta, I believe um, it was. So that is another um, resource um, that uh, folks might want to tap into. And also, uh, the Center for Community Progress has a website uh, related to land banks and um, the location of land banks in the United States, which Jeffrey alluded to. Hey, Catherine? Yep. Okay, one of the other questions is, for neighborhood block groups already working and affiliated with CDCs, what is the best way to start building momentum for CLTs and more importantly, limited equity cooperatives? How can folks with limited resources uh, leverage limited resources to get these organizations off the ground in their communities? Maybe hope you could talk about uh, some of the CDCs you work with and I believe what, four Columbus neighborhoods, their relationship to uh, the land bank and the land trust? Well, um, <clears throat> yes, definitely. I, I think we're a little different in the fact that we're a land bank that covers the, whole, or a land trust that covers the whole county, but we felt the real need to work with uh, smaller uh, nonprofit groups right off the bat. And so, um, you know, not everyone is set up to do a, a land trust that covers a whole county. So the best thing to do is to start meeting with like-minded people and try to get as many people to the table as possible um, to make an effort to um, figure out, you know, some basic things. Is this going to be a land trust that's in a small area? Is it something that you want to include multiple neighborhoods? There's so many things to discuss, but um, getting a collective amount of, you know, different people at the table who are community vested is so important because the buy-in really just has to start from day one. 
and um, trying to see what best approaches are out there for your area is super important. I, 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 I'm sorry to interrupt, but as, as the person who asked the question, I, I think I, um, I, I may have misspoke a little bit. The, the question is, how can folks buy in? Like, let's say, for example, I'm working with a block club and they're like, I'm all in, love the concept. We're union folks here, community land trust, limited equity, you know, is there a process by which they can just deed their properties to the to the CLT if there's if there's already kind of like a you know uh, an operating agreement? Uh, you know, I'm particularly interested in li li limited equity cooperatives. Mm -hmm. I, I I guess I'm I'm th that was more the thrust of my okay of, of, that, of my that, question just to clarify. Yeah, Mark Thank has you. much more experience on that, so I'll defer. <laughs> I think it's talking to Marge. <laughs> so, well, so you need the structure first, right? I um, mean, you need the um, you need the community land trust or the limited equity co-op structure probably in place. So, and then, yeah, I mean, then you need then you need a lawyer, and that's you. So, um, the that then then there is there are those possibilities, and those have happened. You know, I mean, in Yellow Springs, the community land trust, some of their first homes were donated donated properties. Um, so that is a possibility for sure um, for people to do. Um, uh, uh, it isn't, it, but, but the initial organizing within the community to get the, um, you know, the entity kind of off the ground. And, and, you know, I think what happens in communities at the local, the very local level, if they decide to do this, I mean, um, is you can get the organizing and entity kind of going, but you have to decide, are we gonna be a very small grassroots organization that, um, that then wants to build this up? And Oberlin is that, they have an all volunteer board. They had a lot of um, buy-in from um, businesses, um, you know, business people, the city, they based their whole development on a city report on housing. Um, and they have some really smart people who are on their board and going, um, but they don't have a lot of resources yet. So they're just, they're kind of, you know, making it up as they go. Or do you, how much political support, political will do you feel like you need to, to get started? Um, it can be community meetings that are, you know, meeting once a month or every other week and, and kind of just then saying, here we go. Um, and, but then how do you sustain that? And so there's just, there's a lot of, you know, I think it's, uh, it can be small or big depending on how you kind of want to, um, like any nonprofit, you know, um, but then you got to think about sustainability because once you have homeowners, how do you, how do you keep that going? And Ben, you may have some sense of that, you know, it's hard to, it's hard to, and especially in a city like Cleveland, I mean, how do we start to create the political will to say, this is something the city is going to support financially. It is about both political will and, you know, not just what do we say yes to, but what else do we say no to as a city in terms of resources. And so far, I think the challenge is that, um, that the city is not willing to prioritize a permanent affordability as a, um, uh, in, in funding sources. And, and they, they ought to, because one of the other things in the Slavic village is, maybe I'll just make one more quick comment. Slavic village is one of those places where community land trusts are not just about affordable housing and rapidly rising neighborhoods. And John Davis will, you know, is great at this. It is about the upcycle side of the business cycle and the downside. And we prove that here and other places have proved that with foreclosure rates that um, it is about securing land and housing for community needs and making sure that those don't go away um, so that uh, it's a affordable home, it's home ownership and it's not investor owned properties. You know, nobody's going to be able to buy those properties and take them out um, or, um, and, and I think that that is, um, is, is why a community of modest means might want to start a community land trust um, before the market rises, but also to really secure um, land so that it isn't just, you know, frankly, all investor owned. I mean, where are our neighborhoods in Cleveland heading? Um, and that is a reason the city as a whole might want to support 
the development of community land trusts, not just in rising neighborhoods, um, but in up in in all kinds of neighborhoods in the city. Um, I'll stop. Well, thank you. We're almost out of time. I want to. Um, Thank our panel. I think uh, they provided a great deal of information about community land trusts with some excellent examples. Uh, I'm sure many in the uh, audience are going to want to follow uh, up by finding out more or perhaps uh, working, as Zach suggested, to start their own community land trust. I think it's an important issue. And as Marge said, maybe it'll get more national attention if and when we get increased funding out of Congress or the state of Ohio for affordable housing. Um, I'm gonna turn it back to um, Chip for uh, any uh, last announcements about future forums uh, for those of you who were not at the beginning of the program. And I wanna thank again, uh, Catherine for her help on the program and um, for all the uh, members of the audience for joining us today, Chip. Uh, thank you, Dennis, and thank to all of our panel members. And obviously, we have one of the, a large number of land trusts, or not land trusts, land banks in the state of Ohio. We have one of the largest here in Cuyahoga County. And, uh, you know, maybe it's good to have a conversation with Gus Frangos because I think one of the challenges they've had is following the market in terms of the rehab. And it's left parts of Cleveland kind of untested in terms of that, that program. So anyhow, thank you all for coming. Our upcoming forum is going to be in June. So it's kind of yet to be determined the, the 15th to the 22nd on ARPA funds. So we know where they came from. The question is, where are they going and who's going to monitor where they go? Thanks again for everybody. Thanks to our